Hello and welcome to PM. I'm Sally Sara. New South Wales firefighters are battling more than 130 fires across the state. Temperatures have soared into the 40s on what's expected to be the hottest day in the country's history. And emergency warnings have forced residents to evacuate as high winds whip up fire fronts in several states. Shockingly frightening. I mean, I'm an older person and I've lived through a few things. We've been through floods and all. And uh, this is just the most frightening that I've seen. What do you think the chances are of Tarkata getting through this one? Oh, pray to God we do. Well, it's the day that fire authorities have been dreading. The warnings of catastrophic fire conditions have turned into reality in several regions. New South Wales has sweltered. In Sydney, the maximum reached 42.3 degrees, the fifth highest on record. With the heatwave conditions have come the fires. Fire crews are battling blazes in the south of the state near the towns of Wagga Wagga, Cooma and Bega. A number of residents have been told to leave their homes and find safer ground. The situation in Tasmania has also worsened. The Fawcett fire that engulfed the seaside town of Denali is flaring up and threatening more properties on the Tasman Peninsula. In Victoria, firefighters are trying to control a large bushfire in the state's southwest. The 7,000 hectare blaze is moving slowly north, west of Portland. The town of Dartmoor and the farming community of Drick Drick are on alert. Victoria's Country Fire Authority has also issued an emergency warning for an out-of-control grass fire at Chepstow near Ballarat this afternoon. But we begin our coverage in New South Wales, where scores of bushfires are burning across the state. 40 are uncontained, and of those, at least nine are burning out of control. Martin Cudahy reports. Strong winds and scorching temperatures have combined to provide the worst fire conditions in decades. In line with predictions, bushfires have ignited all over southern New South Wales. At Grab and Gullen, south of Crookwell, more than 40 firefighters are working to control a bushfire. Police have been door knocking rural properties, telling people to evacuate. Jessica Post can see the fire from her home. They're moving very, very quickly. The winds are picking up. They're more of a westerly now. And it's spread in a ridiculous amount of time. It's just been so quick. The 21-year-old was surprised at how quickly the fire reached her family property. We looked out the window. My sister looked out the window and screamed fire because it was in the neighbour's paddock, which is about 20 acres away. And then we just grabbed all of the horses. And my sisters and I rode them down the road and to a neighbour's house for safety. My dad's um, a police officer, so he's been called straight back to the fire to go and work there. And my mum's going to pick up the other car and is trying to help all the neighbours evacuate all of their um, animals. At Wandandian on the New South Wales south coast, a bushfire has broken its containment lines. The Rural Fire Service is advising people in nearby coastal communities to move away from bushland to major towns. The New South Wales RFS Commissioner is Shane Fitzsimmons. People need to be alert, they need to keep informed. Uh, being alert, being informed, taking decisive action in light of the fire risk today uh, and heeding the warnings uh, of fires as they develop and spread across these areas. Uh, it is very much a moving feast. To the east of Wagga Wagga at Tarkata, residents were evacuated to the RSL. Rural Fire Service Riverina Zone spokesman Matthew Apps explained what was happening just as the fire was approaching the town. We're just putting uh, tankers at the, each individual um, property uh, as, as they find them to go into property protection. We also got reports now of us uh, impacting uh, to the west of the, of the township and also to the north. The Hume Highway has been closed because of the smoke. At nearby Henty, firefighters managed to stop the blaze from reaching town. On the state's south coast, just north of Bega, Ali Fernandez Markov runs a B&B at Brogo. She and her family were evacuated earlier today. We knew that was just uh, another, you know, two, three kilometres up the road from us. And we both looked at each other and said, we're leaving. So we, you know, took the computer photo albums and jewellery and a few other things and dogs and child and in the car. And we were probably out within 10 minutes. I don't expect uh, you to know what, what's going on over there, but what runs through your mind when you know that there's a fire that close to your home? I'm pretty fearful and really glad that there's the firefighters out there helping. And, and because as we were leaving, many cars were leaving on Morrigal Range Road because it's a heavily forested road. So 
if you're leaving, you need to leave early. In the state's southwest, the historic town of Jerilderie was also threatened. Fire breaks were built, but the wind changed direction, and that fire is still burning out of control. Lindsay Lashbrook from the Mid-Murray Rural Fire Service says it was a close call. Yeah, we were asking people just to um, prepare themselves for the fire front to come through. We have been in contact with the rural people uh, that are in front of the fire and advising us to do that. A cold change has hit southern New South Wales, but it will be a while yet before the threat eases. Shane Fitzsimmons again. We've still got many hours uh, of hot, dry, difficult conditions ahead of us uh, right across different parts of New South Wales. Uh, and, of course, uh, those conditions are, are to extend uh, well beyond nightfall. That's the Commissioner of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Shane Fitzsimmons, ending Martin Cutterhy's report. Well, as we just heard, the town of Tarkata near Wagga Wagga in New South Wales has been in the path of the blaze. Locals have rallied to fight the fire and evacuate residents. I spoke earlier with 73-year-old Gwen Brown. She's helping out at the town's RSL club where people have gathered. The smoke's getting thicker in Tarkata, that's all I can tell you. Can you describe the smoke for us at the moment? I can tell you the smoke is, it is uh, we are just covered in smoke. There's blue smoke and it is prominent. How close is it at the moment, Gwen? Uh, sorry, I don't know. I, we've got a creek that runs to the other side of us and I think it could be, oh dear. Oh my God, it's only a couple of hundred metres away. Have you ever seen anything like this before in Tarkata, Gwen? No, no, not for many years. We had a very big fire many, many, many years ago on a Christmas day, but it really wasn't as bad as the town was in Tristan. The fire stopped at Lower Tarkata and just stopped to the creek. But today the wind is so bad here that it's just stirring it all up. What's the mood like amongst the people at, at the club, Gwen? Very anxious. Very anxious. And what's the plan? If you have to evacuate, where can you go from the uh, club? I do it. It's got a farm that's uh, 10 k to the north of Tarakata, which I think will be safe. And, and they're right on the creek. Oh, very close to the creek. Uh, I'll go that way, but I will lose everything. How frightening is it at the moment, Gwen? Shockingly frightening. I mean, I'm an old person and I've been through a few things. Netherall is in Nimitable, where local residents have been sheltering, and she joins me now. Lexi, what's the situation where you are? Well, sorry, sorry, driving into Cooma from Canberra today, there was a massive cloud of brown smoke rising above the snow mountains, and that's the Yarraben fire, which has now burned 4,400 hectares. I've just been at a property called Nandawa, just south of Cooma. It's serving as a staging ground for firefighters. Uh, going out to nearby properties and as I was there a number of units were sent out to a number of near pro nearby properties to put out spot fires which are threatening those properties. That's really the focus at this moment in this area, saving properties. But the fire is just, uh, too, the conditions here are just too extreme to get the fire under control. The fire is now heading through a pine forest and there are uh, some properties in and around there and uh, there are a number of uh, helicopters controlling those properties they're just too difficult for ground crews to access. And Lexi, tell us how the local residents are feeling. Well, the fire has been burning through the Caribbean Valley and a number of residents have come down from their properties to the Nimitable uh, School, which is serving as a bit of a, a shelter, a, a safer point for those people. Uh, a number have also gone to, to Kuma to stay with friends and family. It seems as though no structures have been destroyed at this stage, but it has come very, very close to some, including Peter Evans, who I spoke to earlier. I got a phone call at 7 o'clock to say that the fire was going to impact our property. Uh, we went straight out, thinking that we'd mow around the house and make sure the tractor had fuel in it to make a fire break, whatever. 
but uh, we got out there and we got told we had to go down and help the neighbour, which we did, and then we got the message we had to clear out. I've never been in this situation, so it's frightening. You've seen fires before, though? Yeah, yeah, caught them, but nothing like this. The smoke, you couldn't believe the smoke. How many uh, properties are there out there, or how many homes are there in the, in the line of fire? Uh, it's probably at least 10 to 12. There is a few, quite a few. And you, it sounds like you're expecting the worst for a few of them at least. Well, I think we might test our insurance policy out. How does it feel? Because you don't know what's happened. No, I'm, I, I want to go out, but I'm not going to go out. <coughs> I'd rather stay here and be safe, I suppose. But there are people out there, they're not safe, I presume. It's, it's worrying, worrying. When do you think you'll be able to get back out there? I suppose the way it's going, probably tomorrow morning we'll be able to go out and have a look and find out the worst. That's local property owner Peter Evans really giving a sense of what it's like for, for people in that district at the moment. Uh, Lexi, how are the conditions likely to unfold? What's expected now? Well, the conditions as I sit in the car here are still very gusty. I'm being buffeted around in my car, so it's very windy still. The fire is still heading in a south-easterly direction. I think there have been a few minor wind changes, but later tonight, around midnight, uh, they were expecting a southerly change and the fire is expected to move in a northerly direction. Uh, conditions are expected to ease a little bit tomorrow. I think it's still going to be very hot, but uh, not as hot as it has been today. And I think there have been around 20 units at least on, on the fire today. Um, four uh, helicopters and a number of fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, so units have been coming in from around the region to assist, uh, but uh, hopefully conditions should, should ease a little bit from these extraordinary conditions that we've seen today. Well, thanks for that update. That's Lexi Metherall in Nimitawal giving us an update on the fire situation there. The federal government uh, has announced that it's activating the Australian Government Disaster Response Plan to give the New South Wales Rural Fire Service essential fuel and refuelling personnel for aerial firefighting operations. The Attorney-General Nicola Roxon says the Rural Fire Service will be given access to Defence Force bases, fuel and personnel trained in specialist refuelling conditions to help combat bushfires across New South Wales. As Roxon says, the Defence Force can provide crucial on-the-ground support to local crews. Well, to Tasmania now, where almost 40 bushfires are still burning, and emergency evacuation orders were issued in the state's southeast today. A fire that's already destroyed more than 100 homes in places including the seaside town of Denali is now threatening holiday homes on the Tasman Peninsula. Strong winds have whipped up the flames this afternoon and some residents have been evacuated. The blaze ripped through the small hamlet of Boomer Bay near Denali on Friday, destroying 15 homes. PM's Felicity Ogilvy prepared this report. It's windy in Burma Bay, thick smoke makes it hard to breathe and the fire service is still here putting out spot fires. Okay, well, you got the idea. There are fires burning in Tasmania. There are fires burning in Victoria. There are fires burning in southern and inland New South Wales. There are fires burning in southwest Queensland. And they're getting temperatures 45 to 48 degrees Celsius, up around the 105 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds 70 to 80 kilometres an hour coming out of central Australia. And as you saw earlier, things are pretty green up here where I am. 30 degrees south of the equator 1100 meters above sea level 3650 feet maybe two kilometers west of the watershed around here you take your forest danger meter and whereas the rest of the country is around here past extreme into catastrophic set the last rainfall against the number of days since rain well in December I had 185 millimeters or 7.4 inches and last day it rained was the 28th it's now the 8th 
of January. So we'll say 12 days since it's rained. And if that's 100, then that's 185. To set arrow against the derived drought factor, which for over 100 millimetres is 3. So we set our arrow against the drought factor of 3. Set air temperature slide 3 against relative humidity slide 2. So 27 degrees, which was the maximum today, against 47% humidity, which is what it is here today. Read off the fire danger index and danger classification on the outer rim opposite the wind speed. And here in the clearing we've got no wind at all, but let's say outside might be 5 to 10 kilometres per hour. So we follow the wind speed around to 10 kilometres an hour, fire danger below low at 2.5. If we've got a 5 kilometre an hour wind, we've got a fire danger of 2. Looking at fuel quantity, we're probably worst case scenario with at least 25 tonnes per hectare. And uh, the fire danger index, they don't start telling you what it's going to be like at anything less than 5. But uh, 140 metres per hour, 3 metre flame height, and a spotting distance of 100 metres. So the tamest possible pussy of a fire that you could have. And what that says is that right here, right now, if I can get anything to burn, I should burn it because it's perfectly safe to burn it right here, right now. So what I really should be doing if I was to try and implement a traditional Aboriginal bushfire fuel hazard reduction management program is this serrated tussock that I didn't get around to whippersnipping at the end of autumn last year and it would burn now and I could burn it quite safely because it's surrounded by stuff which is short and green and relatively fireproof because it did get field slashed I should burn that now. Why am I not burning that now? I'm not burning it now because 90% of New South Wales is under severe fire danger conditions. The RFS is stretched as tight as it can possibly be and uh, they've got me under a total fire ban. So I guess I'm just going to have to keep on field slashing, burning petrol and refining my rain dance which put 12 inches of rain air dropped onto this place in the last couple of months. So I guess while ever the uh, prioritisation of property means that the existence of fences prevents people from doing traditional hazard reduction burning, we're down to rain dancing and field slashing. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Isn't it synchronicitous that last week I made a series of movies about the correct way of burning Australia? Hi Kevin, how you going mate? See, Kevin's not afraid of me. Ciao!